Um, it's a real pleasure to be uh, be able to speak here today at the National Science Foundation. This is one of those impressive places that when you know, I, was, I was a kid growing up in Minnesota and you hear things like this and they're always sponsoring shows like Nova or something else, you'd be like, wow, this is where all the cool scientists go, right? So, so it's exciting for me. It's exciting for me to be here today at that level. And I'm going to give a talk today about, uh, about planet formation in our solar system. But I'm also going to focus a bit on some of the things that are particularly interesting to me running a NASA Lunar Science Institute. I'm going to tell you a little bit on how the moon can tell us about planet formation. And while that seems like a stretch, there's actually a lot the moon can tell us about planet formation. But I'll be covering all the plants. You're going to see a lot of interesting things. But I'll be able to make some sense of that statement. But for that reason, I wanted to start my talk off in this fashion. Oh. I forgot about this. Just for those that don't know what the Southwest Research Institute is in Boulder, um, we're a branch office of Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, which has about 3,000 people. We're a nonprofit that uh, does all sorts of different things. Here in Boulder, we have about, uh, about 60 uh, scientists, and we are working on a variety of different things. Mostly we're funded by grants from the National Science Foundation and NASA. And so think, name almost anything in planetary science, we probably have someone here that's working on it. So it's a lot of fun. Okay. So I want to start off by talking a little bit about, moon, about the moon, even though I'm gonna, my main talk could be about planet formation, because this sort of motivates some of the reasons as to why I'm giving this talk today. Um, one of the reasons I'm in this field, probably the main reason I would say, is I was born in 1966, and so I'm just old enough to remember some of the Apollo landings. Okay? And when I was a little kid watching the astronauts go to the moon and explore this fantastic world and pick up rocks and do all sorts of things, I thought, boy, there's no other better thing that one could get involved with. I gotta somehow be involved in this field. But since that time, it's been somewhat disappointing, I would say personally, to see that the moon and a lot of, I guess, planetary exploration, at least in terms of having humans go to places, has become sort of a been there, done that sort of thing. You know, we have lots of cool things that we can go visit, but it's very hard to actually see a lot of activity going on in this field. And I think part of that, at least in from terms of the moon's perspective, is that the public has almost no idea why we should go back to the moon from a science perspective. And I would argue that probably most planetary scientists, and I would bet most people in this, in this room, don't have any idea why we, should, why we should go back to the moon from a science perspective as well. So I'm going to try to give you some feeling for that in the, in, in the midst of talking about planet formation. And the reason is, is that the moon is not only just a fascinating world, okay, it really is a neat world, but it's also Rosetta Stone. And if you can interpret its constraints correctly, you can learn a lot about the unknown nature of the very early Earth. What was going on in the Earth for the first few billion years of its history? Almost all that information has been erased on the Earth, but it still exists on the moon in some fashion in terms of telling us what's been going on in the solar neighborhood. And also the moon can tell you, if you know how to read it correctly, about the critical last stages of planet formation. And I'm going to talk a lot about that towards the end of my talk and probably show you some things you possibly haven't seen before. Okay. So just to start off with, this is probably, everyone knows this, right? So we have our solar system here. But the, the key thing I wanted to keep in mind here, uh, that I wanted you to keep in mind, is that while our solar system, you know, has got rocky planets close to the sun and big gas giants far away, and we have populations of objects like Pluto and Eris and asteroids and the rest, the solar system did not always look this way. Sometimes I think people think that, you know, the snap your fingers and all the planets were like this, and it's always been this way. We don't think so. We think our planetary system formed out of the same kinds of processes we see going on in nearby solar systems where we have exoplanets forming. All these kinds of, kinds of processes had to happen here once. So we're trying to read the constraints of the solar system to tell us how these, how these planets came about and what processes took part in that case. Um, just because uh, they said it was a public talk, and I'm not sure what my audience is, I want to just mention one thing. Um, most of my talk is going to be filled with movies and animations and things, but there is a unit I'm going to be using quite a bit. Um, I don't really like to deal with kilometers and miles and furlongs and all the rest. So for the most part, I want to be talking about uh, the distance unit between the sun and the earth, and we're going to call that one astronomical unit. So if you hear me say AU during the talk, that's the distance we're talking about. Okay. So some of the some of the what I think are interesting questions I'm going to try to talk about today are first of all where do the planets come from why do we even have planets okay why does the Earth have such a large moon and what does that tell us about planet formation okay why do we have asteroids and comets and what are asteroids and comets what are they really telling us okay why are some of the planets made primarily of rock or just of ice while others are primarily made of gas and then finally and this is one of the more provocative questions have the planets always been where we see them or where we see them today. And it turns out that answer is no. And I'll come back to that in a bit. Okay. So we begin our story. So we'll try to give you the entire history of the solar system in just you know, 50 minutes or so. Okay. So we're going to start off with uh, something that's probably near and dear to a lot of the people that work here at NSF, which is what's going on in the galaxy. 
Okay, so what we think happens is when we look out in the galaxy, we see huge expanses where there's large clouds of gas and dust. And in some fashion, we think, when we look at all the different processes that happen in the galaxy, that these clouds, in some cases, undergo collapse and start the beginnings of, our, of a star-forming region in our solar system. Uh, the means of collapse vary, but most, some people argued it might have been triggered by, in some cases, a supernova where the blast wave causes the cloud to collapse. Okay? So once we get beyond that, we then have the issues of going from a cloud, which is maybe almost on the order of a light year across, where it's maybe slowly spinning, to where it's a collapsing upon itself. So this is sort of a top view of what such a system might look like. This is a side view of what a system's looking like. So it's collapsing down to a distance of maybe on the order of about 100 AU, so about 100 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. It starts spinning more rapidly as it comes down and forms into a disk, just from angular momentum arguments. Basically, you know, you pull, the skater pulls in his arms and starts to spin more quickly. In the center of this system, we're starting to develop a proto-sun, the place, the most dense region of uh, the system. And then outside, we're having a disk of material which is rotating, which has a lot less mass, but out of that disk is what forms our planets. Okay. Okay, so we'll go forward from there. And the thing to keep in mind, too, is this isn't just one single cloud, that's, or the, excuse me, the cloud is collapsing, but there's often lots of things going on within this cloud. We actually can get star-forming regions and lots of solar systems forming in similar areas at similar times. So this is an animation of what a lot of these mutually interacting systems might be like. If you ever wanted to see what an active star-forming re star region would be like, uh, one way to do is uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, we can look at the Orion Nebula. This is kind of fun. If you've ever seen Orion in the sp sky, there's Orion's belt, and there's some of the main stars of Orion. It turns out that's a major star-forming region. There's lots of little solar systems that are forming out of this. Big stars and little stars, all sorts of doing things. And these systems can actually interact with one another at times. So in some cases, you have isolated systems which go away out of the star cluster. In other cases, you can interact, and they can actually share material. There's been a recent paper out to suggest that our star system itself may actually have comets that were grabbed from other parts of the, of the star cluster. So some of the comets we have may not be our comets, but they may be from related stars, which is an interesting idea. So there's lots of dynamical fun you can have here. Okay. But so then eventually, we're going to move on from there. And eventually we get down to a system that looks something like this. So we have a disk, we have material accreting onto the star. So what happens then? And there's a lot one could talk about. You could spend whole weeks worrying about all the processes that are going on in, in the disk. But I'm going to try to break it down into some simple things for this talk, which is basically from this point on, I'm not going to worry about magnetic fields. I'm not going to worry about radiation forces. For the most part, I'm just going to worry about two different processes, collisions and gravitational forces. And those are the main processes that you could do a lot with in the solar system, and they can tell you a lot about how things evolve. So if we go from that, somehow we have to go from this big, gaseous, dusty thing into planets. And so how does that work? Well, what we first have to do is start to grow planetesimals. Now, planetesimals are tiny little plants. So these are basically things that look like asteroids, look like comets. We have to grow them out of our, our disk of gas and dust. Now, what we think is happening is that some of these, uh, some of these disks are turbulent. And in, in, in vortexes that get set up, you get concentrations of material. And in those vortexes, you can get concentrations that which you see sort of see here, but which by self-gravity just allow material to come together and start to make planetesimals. So in these little clumps you see here, you start to get lots of high, lots of collisions, and eventually you form things which are much larger than the little grains or little boulder-sized guys that exist in the disk. So eventually you go from this, from objects that are maybe small, up to objects that are maybe many tens of miles across or more. You know, what I would say is on the order of about 100 kilometers or so. Okay. So from then, the next process we have to worry about are collisions. So this is an example of a, a numerical hydrocode simulation where we, here we have two asteroids slamming into one another at high enough velocities that they mostly undergo fragmentation, and so things fall apart. So if you hit it fast enough velocities, you don't hold things together. But if things hit slowly enough, you don't tend to lose very much by fragmentation. You mostly get material that's accreting together, and so you start to form larger and larger objects. And once you get a large enough object, it starts to grab all the material it can around it and undergoes a runaway. And eventually, you start to evolve up to moon to Mars-sized protoplanets. Okay, so you keep going up and up. And we'll go forward from here. And so eventually, it's at some point, maybe a few million years into the system, we have our star system, or excuse me, our solar system starts to look a little bit like this, where we have a protostar. We have lots of planetesimals and bigger objects, which we'll call planetary embryos here, all with surrounded by some gas. And then in the outer solar system, we have essentially the same things taking place. But here, the main constituent is not rock, but it's more ice and rock. Okay, and we'll talk more about the outer solar system in a little bit later. But for the moment, we're just going to concentrate on the inner solar system. So how do we go from what we have right here to planets? Okay, so the next process we'll have is this is just a little animation I put together just to give you a feeling for this. This is distance from uh, the sun. 
And this is how massive things can be. So you see up here, if something gets this big, they're one Earth mass in size. And at this point, we're just going to allow gravity to do its business. So we're going to assume that all these moon to Mars size objects have formed throughout the disk in different regions. And now they're finally getting big enough to gravitationally interact with one another. Okay, so put a little movie on. Okay, the little error bars you see are just telling you how close you get to the sun and how far you get from the sun. And pretty soon what you see is a couple objects start to run away. They start to get very massive and they eat up all these little guys. And they keep going and going, and eventually you get to a point where there's very few of these planetary embryos left, and you start to get objects which have about the right distance and about the right mass for our system of planets. Okay, so sort of stop that right here. And you take a look at where the Earth and Venus are, and it's actually not too bad. We get planets, uh, Mercury and Mars are pretty small down here, and we get big objects right here. The distances are right, the orbits are about right. Now, there's a lot of issues going on today with uh, the formation of these terrestrial planets, and much more than I could talk about. There's a lot of issues, a lot of interesting things going on. But at the simplest order, these models do a pretty good job of giving us what we see. And so we think they're probably on the right track of telling us how we got to our planets. So we think our planets grew up from smaller guys to bigger guys to eventually very big guys. Okay, so somewhere in this process comes in the moon. Okay, so what is the moon telling us? Well, one of the things that's very special about our Earth is where that the only terrestrial planet that has a very large single moon, other planets like Mars have really tiny little moons. And actually, if you look at the size of our planet compared to the size of our moon, we have one of the largest moons in our solar system. Okay, everything else, Jupiter has, you know, has big moons, but it's also a very enormous planet. So something happened to give us this moon. But also there's something else. There's some clues that the moon is uh, revealing about, that tell us about planet formation. One of the big things is that the moon is remarkably depleted in iron. The Earth, we know, has a big core. We can just tell that from the gravity we have and the bulk density of the Earth. The moon, on the other hand, we think at best maybe has a tiny little core, maybe on the order of a few hundred kilometers or so uh, compared to its size. And the moon, is, the moon is remarkably depleted on its surface of iron. So something has happened that's very special to get rid of a lot of material in the moon and change it to what we have today. Okay, and so people have been looking at different scenarios for how you make the moon for years and years, and eventually everyone sort of coalesced on one particular model which seemed to fit the properties the best. And that was the idea that our moon was formed in a giant impact. Okay, so the idea would be very early on in solar system history, when all these big moon to Mars sized objects were wandering around, our proto-Earth got pretty big, and one of the last big impacts that happened on the Earth was probably from, the ob from, the, from an object that was about half the size of the Earth, or about Mars sized. Okay, so here's the early Earth, the red represents the core. Here's are the core of the projector. Here's the projector, and you can see it has a pretty big core. And we're going to put on a little. Uh, this is a hydrocode simulation of what happens here. Okay, so the object comes in, and you'll notice that most of the red, most of the iron from the projector, is in, is going into the proto Earth. Okay, and then out of this disk that forms, if you wait long enough, maybe on the order of tens of years or hundreds of years or so, eventually you'll grow a moon. So this is a work all done by a colleague of mine, Robin Knup, in our department. And the nice thing about this model is it gives us a lot of the constraints we have. Okay, first of all, it gives us a large moon. It explains why the Earth-Moon system has such a high angle of momentum. Uh, it explains the lack of iron in the moon. But it also, it's something that's very natural out of planet formation. We expect very large impacts to happen towards the end of the cycle. And so get, having the Earth getting hit by something mars size is not a surprise. It's something that we expect to have happen, which is neat. Okay. And that simulation wasn't, if you were expecting to see the moon grow out of that simulation, that's, uh, unfortunately that simulation takes a lot of comp computation time, only to go for a few days of, of simulation time. So what we do is we take these parameters, we put them over to different uh, numerical codes to track things further, and after, about a, after uh, many weeks or months or years or so, you start to see a little moon grow into a bigger moon, and eventually we get something that's like our moon. And the issue is how fast did it form? If the moon formed really, really fast, it should have melted almost all the way down to its core. If it formed very slowly, it shouldn't have melted at all. So you can use the constraints we have that brought back from Apollo to tell us something about how planet formation works in our own little protolunar system. Okay. Okay. And here's a more spectacular animation of how these works. Right. So, you know, this just gives you a feeling for you know big impacts on the Earth, and you can see the temperatures that are raised at you know about 11,000 degrees or so. So you know if you're on the Earth, it's a bad day. Right. You know this is a good day to visit Grandma or something. You don't want to be at home. Okay. And um, you know it's it's pretty spectacular, but also this, pro this event probably produces a magma ocean on the Earth and on the Moon. So it, very shortly after this event, both worlds were really very hot, molten places. Okay, so, so something to keep in mind here as well is a lot of our parameters we think about in terms of you know, how, what makes the Earth our Earth. 
come from this particular event. Okay? We think uh, today, or today, the orbit of the moon is at about 60 Earth radii, and we have about a 24-hour day or so. But if you, if you use angular momentum and you go backwards in time, the you know, moon has evolved out by tidal forces, back at the very beginning, uh, the Earth probably had only had about a five-hour day. Okay? And that's when the moon formed just a few Earth radii away from the Earth. And that was almost four and a half billion years ago. So the moon would have been much bigger in the sky. It was a very different place. Okay? But our day is set by what's been going on with the moon and its evolution over billions of years. Okay? And some other things to keep in mind, too. The tilt of our planet, it's about 23 degrees with respect to the plane of the solar system, that was also largely set by big impacts. Okay? Big impacts probably t tipped it on its side a little bit. Um, and the thing to keep in mind with all this is, again, this is something of a chance event. And the probabilities turn out to be very high that our Earth would end up having a big moon. But if you went to a thousand systems that were all very similar to ours, and they all evolved in similar ways, some of them might have a moon like ours, but it might have slightly different properties. Some might have smaller moons. Some might, not have, no, some might have no moon whatsoever. Okay, so there's a lot of randomness that happens in these systems. And so you have to account for that when you, account, when you try to determine how, why our system got the way it is. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to move a little bit out to the asteroid belt. Okay, so this is, this is near and dear to my heart. This is where I've spent a lot of my research time. Um, so, the, so this is um, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and Jupiter is out here. And this is a, a little animation of many of the objects that are in the asteroid belt. It turns out that we have about a million objects that we believe are there at least a half mile across or so between Mars and Jupiter or so. And if, I guess you can't, well, I won't talk about, I was going to talk about the Trojans, but they're hard to see. If you look, there's a little cloud of asteroids a little bit before and a little bit after. These are actually asteroids that were captured onto orbits identical to Jupiter. They just happen to have trailing orbits or leading orbits. They're fun as well, but they're hard to see, so I won't talk about them. Um, so one of the interesting things is that, you know, one of the reasons I'm in this field, I said, was because of the Apollo program. There's another big reason I'm in this field. Okay, back when I was a kid, I saw a really interesting uh, documentary on all about asteroids and what asteroids can do. And I thought this was pretty interesting. And so I went into, uh, you know, various things. And I tracked down a little bit of video. So I thought I'd show you some of this video from, this, from one of these uh, shows that actually made me into the astronomer I am today. So here it is. So I always think we could stop my talk and just watch the movie and we'd all be happy. But, you know, it's, but there is a reason I showed this, other than that it's a fun clip, is that you know, when, you look at, when you look at this, uh, this great film right, and you, you look at all the asteroids careening around, it's the impression most people have of the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt is this extremely dangerous place where rocks are tumbling around and collisions happen all the time. And if you send a spacecraft out there, it's almost inevitable it's going to get hit by something. Well, in fact, it's not quite that way in reality. Okay. If you were to take all the asteroids you have and you were to place them into one single object, the total mass of that object would only be about 5% the mass of the moon. Okay, so there's, if you take the Earth and Mars, that's about the entire mass of the asteroid belt, all in about the largest asteroid, which is called Ceres. So it's not much stuff. Okay, and you're taking it and you're spreading this stuff over a huge distance. So in reality, when we design spacecraft trajectories, it's not so much do we have an asteroid or do we have to worry about the spacecraft getting hit. It's more can we design a trajectory to actually encounter something on the way out there, okay? Okay, so how do we get this asteroid belt with such a low mass? It's a little bit of a, of a problem because if you're going to make asteroids, asteroids are planetesimals, you need, it seems like you would need to have a lot of mass. Yet today there's almost no mass out in the asteroid belt. So what happened? Okay, well, this is a little animation to show off how the, how the uh, evolution of the asteroid belt is related to planet formation, okay? So what we have here is this is distance from the sun, okay, and in and, and AU, this is elongation of the orbit. I'm pretty sure people have probably heard this before, but this is what we call eccentricity. So these are very, very circular orbits. Okay? And over here we have very elongate orbits. So these guys would come very, very close to the sun or very, very far from the sun. We've put about equal masses in our little moon to Mars size guys, these protoplanets. And the green dots are planetesimals. And out here is Jupiter. And so keep track of what happens in the asteroid belt here. So you notice that we're starting off with lots of mass in the asteroid belt and even uh, moon to Mars size objects in the asteroid belt. So let me start a little animation here. Okay. So you see, dynamically, they're, get, they're all exciting one another. So gravitationally, they're getting pumped up. And eventually, they actually sort of remove each, move each other from the asteroid belt. And you're left with only a few green dots left. Okay? Now, lots of things are happening here in the inner solar system. And eventually, you're going to get Venus and Earth and all the rest of other things here. But out in the asteroid belt, you've depleted most of the mass. 
Now, it turns out there's a lot of action happening here as well. There may be other methods as to what have, might have cleared the asteroid belt. But in the end, they all sort of assume that you started off with a fair amount of mass here that went away. So one of the reasons we may have a low-mass asteroid belt is because of the same kinds of processes that involve the planet formation. Okay? It's just a natural byproduct of that. Okay. And just to give you a feeling for asteroids, they come in all shapes and sizes. And you can see that you know, so some of these guys are just maybe, this is about a, this is about a half a kilometer across or so. Uh, this one is about 60 kilometers across. They're all, they're all remarkable. As, you know, being, I grew up in Minnesota, so I would say that all asteroids are above average, you know, that sort of thing. But, it's, but, they're all, uh, but you can see how collisions have really dominated their existence since they formed. Some of them are very rubble pile-ish. Some of them have lar large and small craters. They all have substantial regoliths or so. But these are basically leftovers of the original building blocks which formed the planets. So we can learn a lot about our origins by understanding uh, asteroids. Now, some of these asteroids are very big. So this is the best image we have today uh, from HST of the largest asteroid, which is Ceres. Ceres is large enough, almost, almost 600 miles across, that by gravity it's been able to pull itself into mostly a sphere. And so for that reason, because of that property, we would call it classified as a dwarf planet. There's another asteroid out there called Vesta, which has also been, for the most part, been able to do the same things. This is actually the target of a spacecraft mission called Dawn. Dawn is going to go to Vesta next summer, and then a few years later it's going to go on to Ceres. And so pretty soon we'll know a lot about some of the interesting bodies we have among the largest asteroids. But something to keep in mind, just because, you know, for those that think asteroids are just big, boring pieces of rock, okay, Ceres may actually have a uh, subsurface ocean or at least an ice layer. Okay, there's some reason to suggest that from its shape. And so it could be that so there's some very interesting things going on in the interior of Ceres. Ceres might be uh, quite some world. So looking forward to see what happens. Yeah? I'm not an astronomer, so this is a nice question. Why, so that's from the Hubble Space Telescope? Yes. Why do we have amazing images of things 10 million light years away and such a terrible image of something that's in our neighborhood? It's really small. You know, the things that are far away are big and bright and, and emit light for most parts. The, this is only about 1,000 kilometers across, so it's basically just a speck, and it's very hard to see. So you'll notice that, um, you know, for the most part, it's very hard to see any of these guys unless we have spacecraft going up and getting in situ images. So, yeah, I mean, I wish they were better, too. So, so the image of Pluto would be equally bad from Hubble. Oh, yeah. It, it's much worse. It's, uh, well, is it much worse? Yeah, it's actually there's fewer pixels across. Uh, I think, I'm trying to remember if later in the talk I show you an actual HST picture of Pluto, but it's not much better. Uh, but we have a spacecraft going there as well. So, Okay. So the other thing to keep in mind, especially because you guys are in Washington, right, is that, is that most of you have probably even seen or even possibly even touched an asteroid because meteorites are from asteroids. Okay? You go over to the Smithsonian, to the Natural, uh, the, museum, uh, the Natural History Museum, they have an incredible meteorite collection. Every time I come to Washington, if I have any extra time, I run over there and take a look at it because it's just wonderful. But essentially, you know, the thing to keep in mind is meteorites are hand samples of asteroids. They've just survived passage through our atmosphere. They land on the surface. And if you properly analyze these, they can tell you a lot about what was going on in the solar nebula at the time the planetesimals were forming. Okay, so you can learn a lot from these meteorites, but you have to be able to place them in the appropriate context. That's really the trick. But there's, uh, there, there's no end to interesting things you can do with these things. Okay, so now we're going to go from the inner solar system to the outer solar system. Okay, so some of the same processes I just talked about are also applicable out here, but now we have a few extra elements that are going on here. Okay, so the question is, all these objects that we formed here, Earth and Venus and Mars and the rest, are all pretty small and pretty rocky. That's not the case of what formed out here. So what was different? Okay, well, there's still a lot of debate about precisely how this works, but the idea is that as you go far enough from the sun, okay, you start to be able to reach a point where you can condense ice out of the solar nebula. Okay, so when this happens, you start to get little, uh, little grains that have ice-rich uh, ice material. That may actually start to evolve with the disk. As it evolves inward and it gets close enough to the sun, it starts to lose all this material, and you start to build up something of a snowbank. Basically, there's a, w beyond what we would call the snow line or the frost line or whatever you want to characterize it, you start to build up a lot of icy material. And you eventually reach a point where you have such a density, a density gradient that you can actually build very large objects, maybe objects much larger than the Earth over a fairly short amount of time. So objects maybe five Earth masses, ten Earth masses in size. When you do that, you get an added advantage in that a lot of your gas that's left over in the disk is still out at those distances. So this is a simulation where you see a big gaseous disk, and we actually have a little, uh, five, I think about a ten Earth mass planet here that's grabbing gas out of the disk. So this is how the surface density is changing over time. 
And what you'll see is that as you start to grab more gas, your planet gets more massive. You start to get more massive, you can grab even more gas, and a whole runaway process takes place. And eventually, you clear a huge zone in here. Okay? So eventually, there's very little gas here, and you've depleted this region. And interesting, from a dynamical perspective, which is something I do, there's all sorts of interesting effects that take place when you start to get, these planets start to get massive and they start to gravitationally interact with the disk. It can cause planet migration. And that's why we get some of our exoplanets in such crazy orbits. Some, some planets we find that are massive actually can be living very close to the star. That's because they gravitationally interact with the disk and they actually migrate in towards the star. There's all sorts of weird things that can happen here. But we think this is probably what took place, and that's why we have Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune that are so different from our planets of the inner solar system. Okay. So that takes us to the gas giants. And now we're going to talk a little bit about these guys out here. So Pluto and Charon and, and Eris and the rest. So, so given I have a mixed audience, and it, I thought I should put in some, um, some audience participation. You're going to have to help me in this next one. Okay. So one of the reasons we don't talk as much about, until recently, about the objects in the outer solar system is they're really, really hard to detect. You were asking me about, you know, why can't we see these things? It's really hard to find them. So you'll get, an impre- you'll get a feeling for this in this uh, next part. So the first Kuiper Belt object, or the first object beyond uh, Neptune, was found by Clyde Tombaugh. He's just a, a young astronomer who was working at Lowell Observatory, and he gave him the task of trying to find a planet beyond Neptune. Okay, And it's really, really hard. So what they would do is take a picture of the sky, they would get, capture all the information on a glass plate, then it would wait a few weeks and take another picture of the sky, and they would look for anything that would move. So they would place these glass plates on a machine, which allowed them to sort of blink it back and forth, and they would try to look by eye at the objects that moved. And if you look at these plates, it's amazing Clyde was able to find anything. It's really just, again, heroic. So in this slide, I have Pluto. Your job is to find it. Okay? So let's see if you can do it. Okay, so again, it's maybe hard with the lights, but we'll see what we can do. Okay, so I'm going to do what Clyde would do. So I'm going to blink back and forth. Can you find the moving object? Yeah. Okay. Can we see it? Okay, and I'll do this. This will make it a little easier. Okay. Can you see it now? Okay, so it's right about, let's see if I can get it, right about there. Okay. So this shows you how hard it is. Now, now we, have, now we have computer systems that can do this automatically. It turns out the human eye is still quite good at picking this stuff out. But it's only until like the last maybe 15 years or so we've really been able to detect significant numbers of objects out in this population. Okay? And what we've realized is that Pluto is not a single object. And that's why one of the reasons it got uh, um, its classification changed into a different world. But something to keep in mind, though, uh, while Pluto is a big world, so that's actually, that picture right there is what it looks like from HST. This, okay, but you can see even it is smaller than our moon. And it's primarily made of rock and ice. I'm not sure if this is it's entirely so much water. I think there's more rock in Pluto than you think. But there's a lot of objects out there that are very similar in size to Pluto. In fact, we have an object which in, very recently was classified as bigger than Pluto. Just in the last week, there's been some new results that suggest this world, which is called Eris, may actually be more massive but slightly smaller than Pluto. Some of these big guys have moons. There's all sorts of interesting objects out there. But they're all part of sort of a giant belt which we now call the Kuiper Belt, which essentially is the sort of the icy brother or icy sister of the asteroid belt. Okay? It's just this is where all the icy guys go to live and spend their time. Okay? And, but they were formed out of the same primordial disk that formed the planets. Okay? And if you go beyond that point, beyond the Kuiper Belt, which is sort of in the disk of plane, you'll find there's a sort of a spherical cloud of icy objects. These are our, these are our comets that are what we call uh, Oort cloud comets. These are objects that very early on in solar system history were scattered out they were put far, on a far enough orbit away by Jupiter or by Saturn or such. And then, then either the gravitational force of the galaxy or the gravitational force of passing stars changed their orbit enough so they went into the spherical cloud. And so there they sit until some kind of gravitational perturbation sends them back in, and so we can see them as a bright comet in the sky. Okay? So from all this, you would say, okay, I would say that now I've given you this complete tour of the solar system, and it's all done, and it's all very nice. And as of just a few years ago, I would have said, well, that's basically it. Okay, we're done. Okay. For the most part, we understand the main physical processes that are affecting the planets. Okay. And we don't need, you know, and so there's, while there's still things left to do, we've, discovered, we've taken on most of the hard problems. Okay. But now I get to bring out the dirty laundry. Okay. So, so now I'm going to describe a bunch of things that simply don't fit within this classical model. And it's really brought about, I would argue, something of a revolution in our ideas of how the solar system evolves. This is probably mo- most of the stuff you probably haven't seen, which, is, which makes it fun. But I do have to point out, okay, that I am going to violate sort of the traditional views of planet formation in this talk, right? 
And this essentially is that everyone's been sort of assuming that planet formation works a certain way, and you've made certain assumptions, and now we have to break some of those if we're going to fix some of our problems. But it's also exciting, and a lot of the work I'm going to describe to some degree has been driven by all the exciting things we see in these new extraplanetary systems. Okay, so let me talk about our problems. Everyone's got problems. We'll talk about ours. Okay, so first of all, one of our big problems is a major one. So many of us consider ourselves big planetary science, for planet formation experts. Well, if we're big experts, we have this fundamental problem that our models today cannot make Uranus and Neptune, okay? With, with the caveat that the Uranus and Neptune, have, you have to make them exactly where we see them today, within the age of the solar system. It turns out our simulations just take too long. Uranus and Neptune take so long to form with all reasonable dis, uh, uh, disk densities that we have that by the time they actually get up to a decent size, all the gas should be gone. And so Uranus and Neptune would not look like Uranus and Neptune. So somehow we have to fix this problem. But we can't see what's wrong with our models. Our models seem to have all the relevant physics in. They seem to be doing the right job. We're missing something. Okay? Second problem. And this is a problem that's a little more subtle, and so most people have ignored it. But it's actually a big one. Okay? Jupiter and Saturn today are in, not on completely circular orbits. They're in a little bit elongated, a little bit of elliptical orbits. Okay? The problem is if you take, a gas, take an ast uh, excuse me, a, a protoplanet, and it's grabbing gas out of the disk, and it's getting bigger and bigger, all the models suggest that by the end of that, you should have a planet which is on a completely circular orbit. Okay, so that's a big problem. But that's not what Jupiter and Saturn have, so we're missing something there. Okay? Third problem. If you go out to the Kuiper Belt, where all the comets live, where Pluto and the rest live, today the total mass of that population is only about a tenth of an Earth mass, so it's pretty small. In fact, it's so small that you really can't make objects like Pluto and Eris that live in that population. Okay? So we're missing something there. Okay? And so... There's something wrong there. And now we finally get to go back to the moon. It turns out there's some big mysteries left over from the Apollo days on the moon. The thing to keep in mind about the moon is it probably has the most complete and clear history available of the last four and a half billion years of solar system evolution from an impact perspective. And while that's interesting, it turns out that we've been missing something big all the way back in the 70s that's been argued about for about, probably about the last uh, 30, 40 years or so. And something I wanted to mention as well, and this is actually uh, something near and dear to my heart, is that you know, every now and then I see in the press where people say, well, we're going to go to a place and we want to get rocks. Why do we need more rocks? Don't we have enough rocks on the earth? You know, what, you know, what do we need this? The thing about a rock is it's the most efficient way to encode information about a planet. You can learn a remarkable lot if you get the right samples from the right places. Okay? And one of the big stories that came back from Apollo is, again, one of our biggest mysteries. The idea was when we send astronauts to the moon and we brought back rocks, the idea was the moon should probably be about the same age as many of the meteorites that are falling on the Earth. They should have the age that goes back almost all the way to the beginning of the solar system. And that was actually a reasonable idea, but that's not what we found. Okay? Many of the rocks that are on the moon are you know, a very small number have very, very old ages that are almost the same age as meteorites, but many more have ages that are right around about 4 billion years or so. Okay? So and here you can see some of the, the, the age distribution we have, many impact melts and other things that are on the moon. Now, you, you could say, well, you know, what's the difference, right? You know, four and a half billion years versus four billion years. You know, they're both old, so, you know, it all works out. But in fact, that's almost a half a billion years of solar system history, which is really a, an amazing number. You're dealing with processes in the inner solar system. So something big happened to the moon about four billion years ago. And just to emphasize this fact, let's now talk about the impact history of the moon. Okay. So here's uh, the moon, uh, the near side and the far side. It turns out when you do a count, you, we estimate that there's about, about 90 basins, where a basin is a crater that's about 300 kilometers or so. And they formed on the moon somewhere between about 3.8 and 4.6 billion years ago. Here's a topographic map, so it's a little bit easier to see some of the, some of the places. Now, most places on the moon we haven't been to, so we don't have ages for these basins. But the basins we do have ages for, this is a big crater called Imbrium. You see it every night in the night sky, Serenitatis. And Oriental, which is a little bit over to the side, so it's hard, you can't see it from the near side very well. But all these basins have ages, which is about 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago. So again, much, much later than the beginning of the solar system. So, something weird's going on there. Okay? Okay? Now I'm going to talk a little bit about craters. Okay? So, this is a little movie I put where I just had craters forming on a surface. Now, if, if you actually had a sample from a given surface, what you could do is you know how old that surface is, and you could count up all the craters on that surface, and you can come up with an average impact age, or excuse me, an average impact rate. Now, it could be that all the impactors formed very quickly, and there was a long, dull period, and then they formed again, or who knows what happens, but it gives you some information on what the average impact rate is. 
And also, if you know what the impact flux is on a surface, you can use that to give you some idea of how old the surface is, even if you don't have a rock from that surface. That's how we estimate ages across the solar system. So the chronology for the moon and how many craters formed on the or how many craters formed on the moon tells us about the age of surfaces on Mars, on Venus, on you name it. Okay, so everything is inter interconnected here. And what we find on the moon is this is time before present in billions of years. So here's today. Okay, here's about four billion years ago. This is the total number of craters, larger than about four kilometers per square kilometer we found on the moon. And all these different spots are places where we have ages from uh, different, different uh, sample returns, mostly Apollo, some, uh, some, some of the Soviet Luna spacecraft and the rest. And what you see when you look at this okay, is if you go back to about 3.84 billion years ago, there's a suggestion that the impact flux was at least 100 times higher than it is today. Okay, and that's four billion years ago, not four and a half, but four. Okay, so something, again, very big was happening here. This number may even be higher because we have to worry about crater saturation. So there's some suggestion that something very, very big was happening on the moon at this time. Okay? So I'm going to argue, I'm going to now make an argument that all these problems I've described are all actually related. Okay? And they're related to something that's just recently, I think, would argue is one of the big advances in the field. And it had, it's what's now referred to as the Nice model, or the Nice model. You know, it's a pun. It's fun. Okay, so, so what happened is that about, about uh, five years ago or so, four researchers, uh, Hal Levison, who works in my department, um, Alessandro Morbidelli, Clementa Saganis, and Rodney Gomez, were working under, you know, re really difficult conditions, you know, on, on the French Riviera. You know, they had this, this is actually the view from the observatory there, if you've ever been there. So, you know, you have to deal with the wonderful French food and the great views and everything. You have to try to do science at the same time. So, you know, NSF funds us, right? So anyway, but, um, but to any event, um, they spent about uh, a year working together, and they were trying to deal with some of the problems I was just describing. And they couldn't get things to work. Okay, and things weren't working and things weren't working. And finally, I think in somewhat of a desperation move, they said, okay, there must be some assumption we're making that is uh, preventing us from getting the right answer. And so they looked at all their assumptions. And one of their major assumptions that they realized they were making that didn't have to be true was that the planets formed where we see them today. So in the old view, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all form in pretty much where we see them today. And then out here you have this population of comets. And that's been the view everyone's adopted for a very long time. It turns out that doesn't work very well. So they tried something else. They said, let's try forming the giant planets in a more compact configuration. So where this is about 5 AU, the uh, Neptune formed at about 15 AU or so. And beyond there, rather than having this little puny disk of comets, you have a disk of comets which is about several tens of Earth masses in size. Okay? So this is a very different configuration. Okay? So, so why do they do this? What are the advantages of this? Okay? Well, one of the reasons is that if you move Uranus and Neptune closer to the Sun, Things just move faster. You have, a more, you have more mass you can accrete over a shorter amount of time. And so all of a sudden, you can start to make Uranus and Neptune over reasonable time scales. Okay? Also, because you now have a primordial disk of comets, which is very massive, over reasonable time scales, you can start to make dwarf planets like Pluto and Eris. So there's lots of things to like here. Okay? The downside. Okay, the downside is that the planets are in completely the wrong places. So that's, you know, that's kind of a big downside, right? And the other part of it is this disk of comets is huge compared to what we see today. But, you know, we have examples in the solar system, or I just showed you, where the asteroid belt we think was very massive, and most of the mass went away dynamically. So could something very similar happen out here? So that's what they decided to model. So they put this into a numerical simulation. Okay? So what you're looking at is this is a top view of, the sol of, that, sol of that system. This is sort of a side view. Here's, here's distance from the sun. Here's eccentricity. All the giant planets here start on circular orbits, just like we would expect them to come out of uh, our gas accretion models. And out here you have this big disk of comets, and you notice that this disk of comets is losing material. Okay, so what's happening is material is being passed down to Neptune, and it's actually interacting with these planets, and eventually Jupiter throws this stuff out of the solar system. But in the process to conserve angular momentum, these objects are migrating. And so you'll notice this little white dot, which is Saturn, is getting very close to this dashed line. And when it gets there, some very interesting things happen. So we have a little bit of ways to go here, but see it's just stable and it goes on and on. And, you know, not much changes. So take a look and just... About right now. Okay, and take a look. Same thing happens over here. Okay, that's pretty interesting. Okay, and I'm going to show this movie again in a second. So, what happened? Okay, so from a dynamical perspective, I'm going to describe it this way. So, what happened is that Jupiter and Saturn entered into what's called a resonance. Okay, so what's a resonance? This is an example of a resonance. This is where a planet is going around a star, and it goes around twice for every time the outer planet goes around once. 
So you notice that these two guys always meet at the same hash marks. They keep coming back again and again. And that means the gravitational kicks they get at these little marks always have the same geometry. And so over lots and lots of orbits, these gravitational kicks with the same geometry build up, and you actually change the orbits of these objects. Okay? So what happened is that Jupiter and Saturn got into this resonance, and then they actually, over many orbits, changed their orbits, they mutually changed their orbits from ones that were completely circular to ones that were slightly eccentric. Okay? And that literally brought down the house. Okay? So what happens here is this is time in millions of years. This is uh, distance from the sun. So what's happening is that they're evolving out and evolving out and evolving out, and eventually they hit this resonance. And this gives them a little bit of an eccentricity and a little bit of an inclination. That actually destabilizes Uranus and Neptune and throws them into this disk, and they migrate through it. Okay? And in the process, they cause the whole disk to go kablooey. Okay? And that's the technical term, it's kablooey. So, it's a, okay, so it really just goes, and you know, we have a lot of fun. Okay, so, so what? So this is fun, and it all blows up. Well, why do we think this is correct? Okay, well, there's a couple of reasons. Well, first of all, let me talk a little bit about Uranus and Neptune. So this is a case where Uranus and Neptune get thrown into this disk. They start interacting with the disk, and eventually, gravitationally, they calm down. What's happening, we call this dynamical friction. Basically, they're exciting the little guys, but there's enough mass in the little guys to allow Uranus and Neptune to get calm orbits while you excite the rest of the population. Now, now there's, there's two things I want to mention here. First of all, if you're very careful, you'll notice that Uranus and Neptune don't get to the right places. Um, that's because there's not enough mass in the disk. If you put a little more mass in, it all works out. But there's a reason I show this is that if you'll notice when the simulation starts, Uranus and Neptune kind of do a little dipsy do here. here. You'll see them kind of flip around. It turns out in this model, there's about a 50-50 chance that Uranus and Neptune flip positions. Okay? So while today it's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, in the past it may very well have been Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus. And there may even be, uh, a ra there may be a cosmic chemical rationale for why that should have taken place. Okay? So another thing to think about. Okay. So why do we like this model so much? Okay, well, this is a plot. All the blue dots show where our giant planets are today, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The red hashes show simulations from this Nice model from about 20 different cases where they just slightly tweak the initial conditions. And you'll notice as terms of elongation of orbit and inclination, that's basically how inclined you are with respect to the plane of the solar system, you can see we do a pretty good job of explaining all these different um, uh, planetary orbits. In fact, we're the only model that exists today that's even close to being able to do this and explaining all these different parameters. So there's a lot of reason to like this. Okay? So it's very exciting, the idea that we can explain the giant planets by this mechanism. Okay? But what we also get here out of this is we also get why we should have big impacts on the moon about four billion years ago. When you destabilize the disk, you're sending comets across the solar system, and literally almost every body is being bombarded to it within, within an inch of its life. Okay? The moon is getting hit a lot, and the impacts should tell us about this last major event in planet formation. And I should say, it's not just comets as well. Because the giant plants are moving around, they're actually exciting other populations. And so lots of asteroids are crashing down on the, on the moon as well. So asteroids and comets are crashing down on the moon almost a half a billion years after it formed. But not just the moon, the Earth, Venus, Mercury, you name it. And so this, they call this, this, whole, uh, this whole period the late heavy bombardment. And it could be that almost everything we see in the solar system has been affected in one fashion or another by this very formative time of solar system history. Okay, so implications for Mars. It's hard to have a planetary talk and not talk about Mars, right? So we'll talk about Mars for a second. Well, an interesting issue is that we know Mars was probably affected. This, this Mars would have been affected by this event just like the moon was. We should have had lots of impacts on the moon. And there's some suggestion that it could be that during this time, Mars had a lot of cometary impacts that could have been a great time for delivery of water to Mars. We don't actually know when Mars got its water. There's lots of suggestions on the surface that water existed there in one, some quantity. We don't actually know if it had oceans of water. There's lots of controversy over this. But it could very well be that Mars was a very dry place until about 4 billion years ago. Then lots of cometary impacts brought in the water, brought all the things we had. And then it was an interesting time on Mars for several hundreds of millions of years until finally this material started to escape. Mars is a small enough world that it can't really keep its atmosphere very well, so it starts to lose all the volatiles, and so they're either driven underground or they're lost. But it could be a lot of, of the things that are really cool about Mars, possibly even life, go back to this early time on Mars. Okay? And on the Earth, the Earth is also was not neglected. I just want to mention this. So on the Earth, we have almost no geological information left over from this early time in our history. Okay? From the oldest rocks we have only go back to about 3.8 billion years ago. We have some uh, zircons, these tiny little, uh, tiny little um, 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 minerals that go back a little bit further than that. But otherwise, that's it. We have no history. And so the timing of the fact we have no Earth history beyond this time is very interesting. 
Maybe we lost a lot of information when this big bombardment happened on the Earth. What we do have is after this time, we have lots of evidence for big basins hitting, on, hitting the Earth from, uh, during the Archean, from about 3.8 to 2.5. What would happen is if we have a big impact hitting the Earth, it creates a lot of vo uh, volatilized silicates. They actually, excuse me, vaporized silicates. They go up in the atmosphere, they cool, they come down as little spherules. You can see these little spherules here. We have beds of these in different parts of the Earth that people have measured. And these are probably from tremendous impact events happening on the Earth. Okay? So back in the Archean Earth, um, I just did some work on this. I'm going to present at an upcoming conference soon. There's a suggestion that maybe at least 15 very large impact basins formed on the Archean, almost all the way up to 2.5 billion years ago. And this is probably also related to this massive bombardment that happened to the moon. It also happened to our planet. And what's really interesting is when the time of big impacts ends on the Earth, about 2 billion years ago, that actually seems to correspond to the uh, to it clocks, I should say, with a lot of other major events that seem to be happening. When basin formation ends, that's about the time Earth gets its big, great oxidation event. Oxygen goes up remarkably rapidly after basins end. Most of our major continent building seems to happen after the basins end. The oceans enter, this, enter, enter into this very stable state for almost a billion years, where it's dominated by H2S, but that seems to happen again after the impacts end. So I don't know if these, these three things, I don't know if they're, it's coincidence that they seem to time with the basins end, or if they're connections. But it could be a lot of the things we've assumed that happen on Earth just because the Earth is doing things to itself. It could be that, that there are exogenic reasons for some of these things. So we have to think about that. Okay? So one of the reasons we want to go back to the moon, I would argue, okay, and one of the reasons why the moon is an interesting place, is if you get samples from the right places, it really can tell us about the very last stages of planet formation, which are much more interesting, I think, than most people thought. And we, hope, we have great hopes of being able to explain some of the last big mysteries left over from the Apollo program. And I'll stop there. Thank you.